So I, I want to talk about a, a concept that that uh, that sort of hit us between the eyes when we were working on the Riverdale project, and and it was because we had to reach net zero at the lowest possible incremental cost. We we realized that any energy that we didn't save by making the envelope better, by reducing lighting and appliance loads, was gonna increase the size of our photovoltaic array. And we knew that that was gonna cost, uh, at that time, seven or eight dollars per kilowatt per year of capacity, and so we could conserve until we reached that, uh, that cost. And I'll, I'll get to that in a, a bit in a minute. But conservation is always the very best investment, and it's, it's indistinguishable from collection. Um, it's got no moving parts. It, it's good for the life of the building. You put it in there and forget about it. it, it uh, somebody can put up a 10-story building right next door, and it won't perform any less well. Um, it's by far the cheapest and, and most benign form of renewable energy there is. And that's true of any, everything. Uh, the energy that's not used is the very best. So in order to know uh, whether you're getting close or not or, or whether, uh, um, whether you've got any hope of reaching net zero energy, you've got to know how much energy you're using. You've got to, you've got to know how much you're going to collect. You've got to know how much you're going to use. And so the, the, the next step is to, is to model the preliminary design. And I would do this while it's in a very sort of sketchy form before, before it gets pretty and you get attracted to it in case you have to change it. Um, we use Hot 2000 for that. And getting Hot 2000 modeling done may be problematic. And I was just talking to Rob a, a few minutes ago about uh, um, the possibility of organizing a, a, a short course next, uh, next fall for people who want to learn how to do it. How many people are interested just to see whether it's, wow. Holy mackerel. Okay. Anyway, by, by using HOT 2000, you, you end up, I mean, it, you, you put every component of energy use in the house is entered into, into a spreadsheet, and it will spit out not only a total amount of energy consumed, but it will also spit out what the consumption is for each component of the house. So um, it becomes a very useful tool to, to, to help you fine-tune and optimize. And I... I I, I, I can't say enough about the benefits of learning to do it yourself. One of the advantages, I think, and one of the reasons that the, the costs in the, for the Riverdale project were lower than, than, as far as I know so far, any, of the, any other team in the country of the equilibrium houses was that we did the modeling in-house ourselves and we were able to do it over and over and keep tweaking things until we really worked the, worked the costs down. And um, so learning, and, and, I, and I had been building R2000 houses for uh, over 20 years and I learned more in the process of, of modeling and running these iterations over and over and over than I had in the, in the previous is 20 years as far as I can tell from today. So the, the way that works, I mean, in, we, we in Riverdale, we, we said, okay, we know it's going to cost about $7 per kilowatt hour per year for the capacity to collect the, the energy that we don't conserve. So we, we then, I mean, the, the basement floor is, a, is an easy one. We, we said, all right, I, I know we're going to have to insulate under the basement floor. That, so we started with R10. And uh, we, we, we looked down the, the list of the, the uh, report from our Hot 2000 and said, okay, well, that's a pretty big number. We're still losing a fair amount of energy through the basement floor. Be pretty easy to fix that. So we doubled that to R20. And then we said, okay, that's going to cost about, uh, uh, say, seven hundred dollars. It's going to it's going to save. Uh, um, and I can't, I'm sorry, I can't remember the numbers 100 percent here, but but uh, it's going to save X number of kilowatt hours a year. That's that. Uh, so to to save those kilowatt hours a year, it costs us uh, only four dollars a kilowatt hour a year. So um, that's cheaper than PV. So we'll, we'll do it. 
and we, we did that with every element of the house. So we, and that way we knew we weren't spending too much in one area and not enough in another, and, uh, and that we, we had a number down, it wasn't as low as we wanted, but it was a number we could live with. And it's, it's, uh, it's a key ingredient if you're, if you're serious about getting to net zero. And then just a couple of things that are, are too important not to repeat many times. One of them is air tightness. You'll find when the modeling that you're going to have to take a guess at what that air tightness is. Um, you really want to think about choosing a wall system that, that's going to let you get a very airtight house. Nothing you can do has a better payback than, than air tightness. Just uh, if, if you play with the HOT 2000 model, if in our Riverdale house we were to have said, okay, well, we can live with one and a half air changes an hour, pretty tight house, um, it would have cost us 1,300 kilowatt hours a year more than if we could get it down to 0.5 which was our target. And so if you multiply that by seven, you're, you're, you know, it's going to take $9,000 worth of photovoltaic panels to replace that capacity if we had the room. So it's, it's just never um, uh, underestimate the importance of that and, and uh, really start thinking about it from day one. You know, after, after a certain period of time and after a certain number of these, you probably end up not having to go through that detailed optimization process every time and my guess is that if you're going to skip that step if you're expecting to get to net zero you know you should be aiming at at insulation values and air tightness values in in this sort of range and you can see how they compare with with typical uh, R values. Um, you know, you can do it a little faster if you if you start somewhere in that range and then and and not go through quite so many iterations as we did. So the next step, then we've we've optimized the envelope. We've we've got um, we've we've got a new um, a total amount of energy that that uh, uh, that the house is using from from hot 2000, and uh, and and now we want to turn our attention before we go too much further to optimizing passive solar because that's the first uh, most economical renewable energy there is. So we we want to maximize it. Uh, we're going to have to add thermal mass, to, and we want to make sure we're not going to have an overheating problem. This is an area where HOT 2000 is, it gives a fairly sort of clunky result. It, it, it models on a, on a week by week or month by month basis and not an hour by hour basis. But it will tell you if there's overheating by telling you what the, what the uh, air conditioning load would be if you enable that function. So um, there are some, uh, we'll talk about overhangs in, in a second, but, but um, you know, I, I, I always check HOT 2000 first to see whether, whether it's likely we've got some overheating. So uh, in, in the Riverdale project, we, we, uh, we ended up with about 35% of our total space heating needs coming through our south-facing windows. Um, we added a small amount of mass, probably not quite enough. Um, but uh, it was there that I learned of being there on March open houses when it was 20, 20 below outside. I'd look out the window and our overhang that was designed to, according you know, to the, the sort of classic rule of thumb that you'd shade the sun completely on June 21st, was, was cutting off about a third of the window that we could have used that day because it was minus 25 out. And then in, in August, I was noticing that only about two thirds of it was covered because the the uh, the sun had had dropped down lower and was now coming more directly into into the window so so an awning is probably is probably better and 